What's up guys, this is Adam Crossover, I'm back with a new episode of Rav Naruto went to the Marvel Universe Part 3 and if you did enjoy the video, please consider a like and if you're new to my channel and like my content, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more crossover fictions. Now let's begin this new video. Chapter 3 Two Cats and One White Hat Three months had passed since Naruto's unassuming debut as the superhero Patronus and his altercation with Captain America. Crime in Boston has decreased significantly, but many Boston PD officers and citizens do not consider him to be genuine or brave because he does not stick around for photos. Even if a bystander or a news reporter did manage to photograph him, it would be useless because the images were either blurry or of an incorrect target, such as a building. Furthermore, the way he moves around and appears out of nowhere via shunshin only adds to this impression. Naruto thinks this is a fantastic solution, this greatly aids him in concealing his identity and preventing S.H.I.E.L.D. or criminals from locating him and his family. Finally, it keeps the knowledge of his powers hidden from prying eyes, which was crucial, along with keeping his family safe. That is why, unless an opportunity and discretion present themselves, he does not use his powers while on patrol. More specifically, he uses his martial arts and physical prowess to fight regular criminals rather than his powers. The less anyone knows about him and his abilities, especially S.H.I.E.L.D., the better. This coincides with the third tenet of the Assassin Creed, never, ever compromise the Brotherhood, directly or indirectly. However, in Naruto's case, it is to never jeopardize his family and loved ones. And while we're on the subject of the blonde, the homestead had a peaceful day as its owners enjoyed the solitude between the land and the sea outside their manor. While a certain person watched over them above the trees, the animals played with their younglings, nurturing them to take their place in the natural order when the time came. Cute, Naruto thought from a branch, watching a stag and a doe together as the latter gave birth to a lamb. He observed the new family cuddling. It warmed his heart to see the various species of animals interact with their younglings, nurturing them to take their place in the natural order when the time came. Naruto took the stag's unblinking stare as his cue to leave, and shunshined across the homestead grounds and appeared in front of the Uzumaki Manor, home sweet home. Yes, it is, Kuroka agreed as she landed on the back of her lover. While entering the manor, the two exchanged a passionate kiss. Where were you? Naruto replied, closing the door behind them. I saw a doe giving birth to its spawn around the homestead. How cute. It was, actually. Naruto, Kuroka, come in here, Seiko called from the kitchen, and the two complied as they entered the kitchen where Rhea, Medusa, and Seiko were finishing up their lunches. Please take the kids to their chairs. K. Naruto and Kuroka exclaimed as the latter jumped off Naruto's back and took Ashla in her arms, while Naruto grabbed Masaki before they entered the dining room. Soon, lunch was served, and everyone in the house was enjoying their meals together. Rhea and Medusa created a garden near the manor with fresh ingredients such as vegetables, fruit trees, and even a small vineyard after tearing down a couple of rotten stables. In terms of meat, Naruto and Rhea decided to hunt the local animals in the homestead as part of honing their skills in case Naruto lost his powers. Rhea will sometimes bestow her powers on the meat, such as today. Naruto watched his lovers and children live in contentment with each other without the outside world bothering them after filling his stomach with a large sandwich. They'd listen to the news on the crystal skull that served as their television, as well as free cable for the kids to watch shows like SpongeBob SquarePants or iCarly. The crystal skulls, according to the Codex, function as television sets without attracting attention through electrical means. There are three types of crystal skulls. The first is a modern telephone device that allows communication to those who have one. The second has a record and playback feature that allows one to send recorded audiovisual messages to one who has a counterpart crystal skull. The last type, on the other hand, irritated Naruto and his tenants the most. The third type was a monitoring device that could project audiovisual surveillance via a blood connection. Naruto was ecstatic when he discovered the first two types of crystal skulls in what was now the intelligence room. Each type had four of them. Even so, he couldn't believe they were all here. Together, especially after the winter war battle, Naruto doesn't tell the girls about it because he doesn't want to worry them, but dreams or nightmares, for lack of a better word, have plagued him since they arrived in the new world. I have nightmares about him, Kronos, another flashback begins. Thunderous booms erupted from the various clashes between the two sides of the Winter War battle for Karakura town. Their participants unleashed unfathomable power, causing the earth to tremble and the sky to tear. 
except for the battle between Aizen and Yamamoto and Ichigo, none of these come close to the battle between the Greek leader and the former Titan King. A figure was launched through the air with a loud boom before colliding with several buildings and bringing them down. The figure shakily stood and revealed himself to be the cloaked Naruto who rubbed his cheek after being hit by a rather nasty backhand fist. Man, that guy is strong, Naruto grumbled as he raised his sword to prevent a scythe from chopping off his head. He locked gazes with Kronos, who appeared amused but mostly enraged. What's going on with you? Die. I don't intend to, Naruto said as his sword began to sag, and he compensated by quickly conjuring up several chakra arms to pummel Kronos to the ground. He leapt backwards, putting some distance between himself and the former Titan King. Where are you? His answer came when the ground in front of him caved in, revealing a familiar, lethal crescent-shaped blade that threatened to sever his head. As Naruto dug his feet into the ground and spider cracks spread from behind him, Tenkaichi's blade blocked the dreaded scythe in a clash of sparks. Despite being in Karama mode, Naruto ignored the pain of needles in his arms and pushed back against the smirking Kronos. However, it was Naruto who was pushing him back. Kronos easily pushed Naruto through the supports and walls of several buildings during their fight. I see you're struggling, Kronos said casually before kicking Naruto in the stomach. A loud shockwave shook the area as it caved in under the strength of the attack, sending the chakra covered Naruto tumbling and bouncing across the ground. Naruto looked up before standing, swung Tenkaichi, and unleashed a wave of golden chakra after using his blade for a sudden stop and jerk, as well as excruciating pain throughout his right arm. Kronos observed the approaching attack and countered with a swing of his scythe, which released its own wave of black malicious aura. The two energy-based attacks clashed briefly in the center of Naruto and Kronos before the winning wave broke through the opposing wave and quickly approached a specific fighter. Crap. Naruto dodged the attack by jumping to the left in the air. Despite this, the ninja could sense Kronos's malicious power from the wave. Rage and darkness. He sensed an incoming attack and blocked it with Tenkaichi, but this knocked him to the ground. Double crap. Kronos chuckled as he stood over the struggling mortal who dared to oppose him and steal his wife. He drew his scythe closer and encountered more resistance from the golden cloaked boy than before. This is how it should be. You on your back, pleading for mercy as I prepare to take your life. Naruto struggled to say anything. Fight isn't over yet. Asshole. What else can you do? Alone against you? Probably. Little to none, Naruto admitted before smirking as several figures surrounded them. Kronos looked right and was kicked in the face by a high heel, which sent him flying into a building with enough force. When he stood up, several golden flames engulfed him in the surrounding area, as well as several additional buildings. Then came several small blade swings of golden energy in the form of cross-shape attacks. But with everyone, Naruto stood up as Kuroka, Rhea, and Medusa landed beside him. They drew their weapons after Kronos stood up without showing any signs of injury. There is nothing we can do. Trying to act tough, Naruto? Rhea teased the blonde. As I recall, you were fighting Kronos not long ago. Naruto blushed slightly as he approached the Titaness. Don't do that, Rhea. It's true, hubby, Kuroka teased, her cheeks flushed from being turned on by Naruto's hidden power. She leaned in close and whispered something into Naruto's ear. After this, we'll have some sex. Rhea and Medusa sighed as they noticed steam pouring from Naruto's ears like a train as he blushed heavily before attempting to calm himself down. K. Kuroka, did you have to say that at this time? The Nekomata gave him a friendly smile. Yes, just to remind you about my situation. Flirt later, fight now, grumbled Medusa as she prepared her bow and arrow. Got it. Right, Naruto and Kuroka yelled as the former dashed to meet Kronos' charge, accompanied by his team of pretty backups. The city shook under yet another shockwave and was hit by a massive pillar of dual energy made up of gold and black. Flashback concludes, Naruto? Foxy? When Naruto awoke from his trance, he asked, Huh? Rhea, Medusa, Seiko, and Kuroka were all looking at him with concern. What exactly is it? You okay? I'm fine, Rhea, Naruto assured the Titaness, who was skeptical. I'm fine, really. With that, the Uzumaki group continued to eat until an unpleasant odor overtook that of their food. Aw oh man. Which one is it? Seiko inquired, smirking at her fellow girls and friends who had mirrored her own. Naruto smelled the air near Ashla and Masaki and made a disgusted face. Naruto pretended to vomit. Both. 
When he noticed the girls staring at him mischievously, the gears in his head clicked and he groaned. Isn't it my turn already? Go on, Naruto. Rhea motioned to the blonde as he relented and carried the twins in his arms to their room for diaper changes, leaving her and the girls alone. Okay, we need to talk about this. Kuroka paused, her cat ears twitching slightly, a piece of tuna sandwich in her mouth. About what? She inquired, her voice muffled. Don't speak with your food, Kuroka, Rhea pleaded motherly, and the Nekomata swallowed her meal sheepishly. About Naruto and his heroics. Because it was on their minds, Seiko and Medusa stood straight up. I've been thinking the exact same thing for the last three weeks, the two girls said together before looking at each other and laughing a second later. Believe me when I say I adore Naruto for being who he is, but... Neither of us have been able to get some alone time, Kuroka interrupted, her cheeks puffing up. Sure, he takes weekends off and spends every minute with us and the kids, but... Sometimes it's not enough, Medusa said last, as her friends sighed collectively, should we go ahead and tell him? Seiko explained her reasoning with a shake of her head, he has more than enough on his plate as it is. Naruto's heroic alias Patronus had been keeping busy in Boston for the past three months since his unjust fight with Captain America. Robbery, assaults, terror, and even some villains from New York had begun to arrive at the independent center of America, but he had stopped each one. However, each time Naruto was out there, he had several run-ins with Captain America and the S.H.I.E.L.D. agency, but he always managed to elude them. I can never have enough of you girls, Naruto said, surprising the girls after returning inside with his clean children while his clone had the unfortunate misfortune of throwing the used diaper out before it dispelled. Naruto spoke calmly to his daughters after placing them in their cribs. Has this been going through your minds the whole time? Yes, dear, Rhea replied honestly as she took his hand in hers. I'm sorry, girls. I should have known. Naruto said solemnly until he felt something bop his head. The blonde looked around and saw Kuroka with her fist raised next to him. What was that all for? You are who you are, hubby, she says, but we want to spend more time with you. And I, too, you. If I may make a suggestion. Medusa said timidly before speaking aloud in front of all eyes. How about each of us accompanying Naruto on his patrols? Come again for hubby? Naruto inquired, in case his ears weren't working at the time, while Kuroka and Seiko smiled and Rhea nodded. Seiko responded with zeal. That could work. Whenever he goes out to patrol, one of us can help him. Plus, our skills won't deteriorate from extended periods of rest, Medusa added as Naruto tried to speak, but they ignored him. You should be used to it by now, Naruto. I agree with Kurama here, Ashura said. My wife was a fighter when we were alive. While the girls animatedly discussed the schedule, Naruto simply hung his head. It took them about a half hour to finish and look at the male head who was playing with his children. Baby who? Baby you? Naruto cooed, making silly faces at Ashla and Masaki. The twins laughed and hit their baby chair with their hands before reaching for and grabbing their father's nose. Yes, baby you. Cough Naruto. Seiko called out, drawing his attention to them. We decided that each of us will go out with you on patrol for a day. She didn't look pleased, nor did Rhea or Medusa, but Kuroka did, as her swaying tail indicated. The first one to accompany you is, Kuroka. But what about the kids? Says one. Medusa sighed exasperatedly at her lover's obscurity. Didn't you hear? One of us will go with you on patrol, while the rest of us will stay here in the homestead, either training or watching television on the skull thing with the kids. Oh. Okay then. Naruto looked at each of the girls and realized they weren't going to change his mind. Later, he sighed as his children continued to grab his mouth and play hooky with it. Okay, girls, you can come with me, but your outfits must be different. It's already done. Eh? Naruto blinked, realizing the smiles on their faces had told him the entire story. You girls were going to do it even if I had said no, weren't you? He charged, pointing his finger at them. The girls mocked each other by placing their hands on their bosoms. Naruto, you broke our hearts with that accusation, Rhea exclaimed angrily. Naruto and his companions perspired as Kuroka, Medusa, and Seiko expressed their hurt feelings after Rhea finished her piece. I think I need a drink. Both Ashura and Kurama chorused, so do we, so do we. Nighttime, Downtown Boston Museum of Art and Antiquities. Boston is a city in Massachusetts, the last echelon visitors had exited the secured building's doors, and security was making rounds around the perimeter. However, 
there were two suit-clad guards at the front desk with solemn expressions as they watched their small but clear television set in front of them. Come on, come on, come on, please, just one more at bat. Because of their long history of rivalry, the game between the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees was as intense as ever. The two legendary baseball teams were playing in Game 7 of the World Series, with the Red Sox in the outfield and on the mound, and the Yankees at bat in Inning 7. The score was 7-8, with Boston leading and two bases full for New York. There were two strikes and two foul balls. At bat, New York was surrounded. It was entirely up to Boston's pitcher to get them home. Come on. The men tensed as they watched their team's pitcher throw the pitch towards the opposing batter. At that precise moment, the Yankees swung. He struck out, and the ball was expertly caught by the catcher in front of him. After jumping out of their seats, the guards screamed with joy and hugged each other. They were so happy that they didn't notice the security camera monitors flickering with static before it was fixed. The camera feeds had been spliced and replaced with a ghost feed, allowing the perpetrator to enter the museum undetected and through the ventilation system. After a security guard passed by and turned the corner, said person quietly opened a vent. The shadowed figure passed through a series of lasers as he approached the main hall, which houses the majority of the museum's artifacts and paintings. Lasers. Typical, the shadowed figure remarked, touching something in its left arm. The lasers were deactivated almost immediately before the obvious thief casually walked past the various paintings and artifacts in search of a specific object that piqued its interest. Well, well. This is something. A large tome discovered beneath the stone tiles of an old villa in Tuscany, Italy, was the artifact. It was leather bound with many pages, and the majority of the front cover was embossed with a large glyph. As the color briefly shone through the moonlight from above, it resembled a creature with wings and a silver body. Not bad for my first job after coming back from Europe. After a bad experience with a once-loved person, the thief traveled to Europe in search of something or someone to fill the void within. However, nothing could help with that, such as cheap one-night flings in hotels or bathrooms. Nothing but the thrill of stealing priceless jewelry and paintings from renowned museums. Nothing beats committing a crime. However, this does not preclude attempting to assist people who have been abandoned by the law. Something the dear person left a big impression on the thief's life, and he used the skills he learned as a child to rob corrupt millionaires and give the money to the unfortunate after taking a cut. It wasn't the same as stealing for personal gain, but it felt good. The thief took out the piece and put its hand through the hole before pulling the book out, cutting the glass case with small silver claws extended from the fingertips. Hearing heavy footsteps nearby, the thief quickly slid the book into its shoulder bag and raised its right arm just as a small grappling hook fired from the ceiling. The shadowed figure gleefully chuckled before being lifted and fleeing the museum just as the alarms went off minutes later. TTIIPMXTTIIPMXTTIIPM, the following day, Uzumaki Manor in the homestead grounds. Massachusetts is forested. Today was Kuroka's first patrol with her husband, and she was so excited about the prospect that she awoke earlier than the others. In fact, it's far too early, the Nekomata, dressed in her usual kimono, sat impatiently on the couch in the reading room, her sandaled foot tapping the wooden floorboards rapidly. The four apple cores on the table indicated that she had already eaten apples, but she hadn't cooked anything since. Well, she doesn't cook at all. Perhaps I did wake up too early, Kuroka grumbled, her arms crossed, pronouncing her bosom more emphatically. Her pouting was so distracting that she didn't notice Naruto in front of her until, oh, she moaned as their lips met intensely, and it only got deeper. Naruto grabbed Kuroka's buttocks and lifted her off the chair and onto the table, their kiss growing deeper by the second. As Naruto kissed her neck, Kuroka slipped her hands beneath his shirt and caressed his tone chest. You're so lovely, Naruto said softly before pulling away, much to Kuroka's chagrin, good morning. Kuroka drew lead bemusedly, morning. She rose from her seat and followed Naruto out of the manor, down the hill towards the cove, I hate you. You don't mean that, Naruto joked in mock pain as he came to a halt at the destination, holding the codex. Kuroka raised an eyebrow before following her lover's gaze to the top of the cliff, where the manor was located, she laughed as she added two and two together, Naruto, you really won't stop training, huh? She joked. I'm not alone, you're doing it as well, eh? Naruto turned around and smirked at his Nekomata love interest. You need some training, too. Codex, show me the Brotherhood's free running forms. 
Kuroka yelped in surprise as the codex levitated out of Naruto's hands and opened to the required page. At the very least, you need to know how to move like me or the assassins themselves. But what about why? Because, my pretty Nako, we might lose our powers at some point, like when I was in purgatory. Kuroka gulped as her husband mentioned it. She always did when Naruto mentioned purgatory, and she and the girls were surprised when he told them about losing his powers and fighting his cloned parents with taijutsu in the Furinji style. Naruto had been pleading with them ever since to learn basic but necessary skills in case something like this happened to one or all of them. And it's always better to improve one's skills when given the chance, Naruto explained simply as Kuroka struggled to interpret the various sketches of the free form. Finally, he moved in closer and lovingly caressed Kuroka's cheek. I don't want the people we're going to meet to ruin your pretty face. Kuroka finally said, her cheeks flushed, a hey, all right, but I suppose I could just. Let's get started, Naruto said as he approached the rocky wall, followed by the codex. Kuroka stood next to him, sighing in defeat as he looked at her. Okay, follow me and do what I do. Okay. Naruto and Kuroka started their rock climbing training with one of them falling behind, Kuroka struggled to locate the locations where Naruto had climbed in order to follow him. When the Nekomado looked up to see her husband, he was already near the top of the cliff, trailed by the codex. She groaned in pain as her arms, legs, and back ached from lack of use in battle or training. Naruto was standing with his arms crossed in a smirk on his face when a shaky hand reached out and grasped the grass on top. His Nekomada girlfriend soon collapsed on the grass, her chest heaving up and down from exhaustion. I asterisk gasp asterisk hate, asterisk gasp asterisk you. You see it? What? Instead of questioning, Naruto stated, you're a bishop, correct? Kuroka nodded with a curious brow. What was he on about? If I recall correctly, bishops are magic experts, the Nekomata said with another nod. As a result, if you don't train like yourself, you tend to have low physical abilities. Oh, Kuroka moaned, her ears flopped in sorrow. When Naruto lay next to her and their lips again connected, she snapped out of her trance. Their kiss intensified once more as he sat atop her, moaned in pleasure. They split up, much to Kuroka's dismay. What was that all for? That was your reward, Naruto replied before leaning in closer and whispering, there will be more after each round you complete. Kuroka smiled, her eyes widening at the implication, such as, she replied quietly. You're out here on the cliff, facing the ocean. I like the sound of that. Let's get started, Kuroka said eagerly after Naruto assisted her in getting up. He made a clone to transport her to the bottom via Hiroshin and then began the rounds. After two hours, the Shinobi and Nekomata each had 45 rounds, but the latter took longer than Naruto had anticipated due to exhaustion. Normally, a Nekomata or any supernatural creature would be able to perform any physical activity with ease, Kuroka expected a lot more from a reincarnated demon and a senjutsu using Nekosho, but he was surprised. He'd heard about his girlfriend's laziness from her sister, Kaneko, but he didn't expect her physical abilities to be so poor. Kuroka, who was panting heavily, was on her hands and knees trying to regain oxygen. With her butt in front of him. Perfect. Oh! Kuroka exclaimed in surprise as she felt something familiar enter her hymen. She slyly returned Naruto's lustful smile, which she returned so this is my full reward. Yep. Naruto arrived at work and began thrusting his hips in rhythm with Kuroka's, while the latter began to moan in pleasure and lust. As Naruto kneaded Kuroka's breasts after fully opening her kimono's top, exposing them to the world, the sounds of flesh hitting flesh echoed in the breeze. When Naruto thrusted slowly and hard, making her knees weak after each thrust, Kuroka moaned loudly. Naruto leaned forward and grabbed her face before locking lips with her and thrusting deeply into her. I want to face him, Kuroka exclaimed, breaking the kiss and placing a hand on Naruto's shoulder. He came to a halt and allowed her to lie on her back, revealing her enormous and luscious breasts, which taunted him with their perkiness and bounciness, do me. You got it. Naruto continued thrusting, his face buried in her bosom. Kuroka wrapped her legs around Naruto's waist, causing her pleasure to be amplified by the sudden contact and Naruto's increased rhythm. Kuroka sank her fingers through Naruto's shirt and into his back with each thrust, most likely causing him to bleed by now. But he didn't care, and she didn't either. They were once again one. Now they were on their own land, with no one but the girls and children to disturb their blissful isolation. Naruto thrusted hard one more time before the rhythm stopped, 
then scooted up to be aligned with Kuroka's face and kissed her lips once more. They were still linked and would not separate because they didn't come. Naruto gently pushed aside a stray hair to reveal his Nekomata's beautiful face, which was practically glowing as she always did. You're so beautiful. Kuroka replied lustfully with her half-lidded eyes, I know. She spoke into his ear. Now you finish fucking me until I come. Say nothing more. Naruto resumed his thrusts into Kuroka's pussy, eliciting screams of pleasure and lust. Her flushed face only encouraged her to thrust faster and faster, while the screams became louder and louder with each thrust. Her legs tightened around his waist as she felt lustful pleasure and a desire to have more of him inside her. Naruto's cock felt Kuroka's pussy tighten, and they knew it was almost time when his arms wrapped around her back and hers tightened their grip on his back. Inside me. Do it within me. I will. His hips thrusted into her one last time as Naruto and Kuroka screamed in delight as they climaxed and went slack together. He raised himself just enough to face Kuroka again, both of them smiling and glowing. Hubby. Kuroka said after a while as Naruto caressed her cheek. Yeah. Nekomata had a solemn expression on his face. I want babies, she said emphatically, and Naruto chuckled before kissing her again. I know, he said as he looked down at their still connected parts and oozed their mixed juices together. If you're not pregnant after this, then, his joke was cut short by Kuroka's hardening gaze. I'm dead serious. Naruto could see it in her eyes and knew exactly what she was talking about, but he couldn't blame her. Kuroka's race, the Nekomata race, was entirely made up of females who would mate with males of other races, though they preferred human males. However, the race is almost extinct because newborns are always females. Males are extremely rare. Kuroka as a Nekosho, a rare subspecies of Nekomata capable of manipulating Senjutsu and thus becoming more powerful, but also allegedly drunk with said power. Back in the Soul Universe, the three factions saw them as dangerous and used their agents to track them down. Kuroka was said to have become drunk on Senjutsu power and killed her master with glee, earning the wrath of the underworld. But Naruit suspected there was more to the story and had asked her privately about the true events, hoping she trusted him enough at the time. She did it. Kuroka did it to protect her sister from their master, who wanted to use Kaneko to figure out how to use Senjutsu and use the story to draw the underworld's attention to her. Kuroka and her sister, Shion, better known as Kaneko, were among the few Nekosho still alive, as far as he knew. Kuroka had been insistent on having children with Naruto since they became boyfriend and girlfriend, hoping that their children would be born strong and powerful with shinobi genes aka chakra. I know I'm good, Naruto explained, but these things take time even for us. I know you're impatient, but I don't want you to be sorry later. What exactly do you mean? Naruto continued to stroke Kuroka's cheek as he said, you're rushing it, and once you get what you want, you'll feel empty, causing him to chuckle in relief. I get a little jealous whenever I see you playing with your kids, Ashla and Masaki, Kuroka confessed, much to Naruto's surprise, I just thought I'd be a mother by now. Naruto smiled at her, kissing her lips again out of love and concern. When it happens, it happens, dot and you'll be the happiest woman on the planet, just as I'll be the happiest man on the planet. She looked him in the eyes and knew he was correct. It may take time, even for her kind, and the amount of sex may be greater, but she'll be overjoyed when it happens. You're right, Kuroka said as she initiated another kiss. And the best part is that you aren't pregnant yet. What? Naruto drew his ear closer to hers. We get to try again, he said singsongly. Damn right, Kuroka said with a smirk, adding, but we'd do it even if I was pregnant. Is that correct? The two cringed as they turned around to see the pajama-clad group, Seiko, Medusa, and Rhea, who was carrying the ever-curious twins in her arms, all with strained smiles and signs of sleepiness. Seiko, for example, held her sheathed katana in her hands before drawing the blade and pointing the edge at the connected couple. Your screams have woken us all up. Still inside Kuroka, Naruto grabbed her buttocks and shunshined out of the way just as Seiko's blade missed him. The homestead had eventually become a playground for the two teams to play cat and mouse, while Rhea watched with the codex floating next to her as Ashla and Masaki cooed against her bosom. Nighttime, South Boston District Boston is a city in Massachusetts. The assassin, Ninja, dressed in his robes, stood atop one of the buildings, shielded from his potential enemies by the night sky. In this case, there is only one foe, although he is unsure whether the individual is an enemy at all. Naruto discovered he had a tail on him after prowling across the rooftops of four Boston neighborhoods, 
it was a black Chevrolet van with room for several people that appeared to be suitable for tracking down someone. This van and its driver had been tailing him since he stopped a bank robbery two weeks before. When Naruto saw the van near a burning building after saving the residents, he thought it was an illusion, but his suspicions grew with each reappearance in different locations where he stopped different types of crime. The van was once again stationed in a nearby alley near a jewelry store two blocks away from his location. Perhaps it's time for this person and I to meet, Naruto said aloud before shunshining to the alley. When the ninja arrived, he noticed the van was slightly rocking back and forth and heard some curses from inside before the engine blared to life. Naruto let out a chuckle before grabbing the bumper with his hand just as the van accelerated, but it didn't go anywhere if the loud sound of screeching tires was any indication. His strength was the result of constant training, as well as a boost from his and the girl's battle against Kronos. He occasionally scares himself with how strong his body and mind become over time. Naruto smirked under his hood as he dragged the van deeper into the alley, away from curious onlookers. The vehicle finally stopped moving, and Naruto let go of his grip as he walked to the front of the van, specifically the driver's side. Hello there, my name is Patronus, Naruto said in a deep voice. Kurama's chakra allowed him to change the tone of his voice and make it deeper in order to avoid being recognized. May I ask why you've been stalking me for the past two weeks? The driver was a young woman in her 20s, most likely in her early 20s. She had short black wavy hair that was covered by a gray beanie and a slight Asian accent. Her outfit consisted of a dark brown jacket over a black shirt, pants, and boots, with wristbands on her wrists. H hello. She gulped as a golden retractable blade appeared from Patronus's left wrist after he flicked it. My name is Sky. Sky? Sky? What kind of name is Sky? What kind of a name is Patronus? Sky smirked at Naruto as he cleared his throat, it comes from Latin and means, protector. Kind of egotistical, don't you think? No, not really, Naruto replied before returning to his work. Again, why have you been following me? Sky opened and closed her mouth before responding, I'd like to assist you. Why? You literally saved my life. I saved a lot of people over the last three months, so please forgive me if I forget. It was when that mutant saved someone from a burning building, he had super strength, Sky explained before going to the back of her van and motioning Patronus to come around. So he went in and found the sliding door open and Sky sitting in front of a laptop with a few bulky looking electric boxes nearby. A quick glance around revealed several pieces of clothing in a large plastic bag and an air mattress in the back of the van. Do you live in here? He asked as he drew his hidden blade back. Yep. Sky replied curtly as her fingers rushed across the keyboard, bringing up the various data files on the large screen. Can't you choose where you live? Naruto paused before asking. Where are your parents? His pause was justified when Sky briefly paused her typing before continuing. Sorry. Don't be. Sky replied before opening the selected file and moving slightly out of the way for Patronus to see. Remember him now? Naruto examined the photograph closely and remembered the man. It was a burning building near Fenway Park, the home of the Boston Red Sox, and he had seen the smoke that day while on his way to watch a game. When Naruto arrived, he discovered that the man in a hoodie had jumped from the two-story building with a woman in his arms and landed under a crater. Naruto wanted to congratulate the man before he took off, but his suspicions were aroused when he overheard the firemen discussing the mysterious cause of the fire. Something about a firebug and a kerosene chemical. Naruto later tracked him down to an abandoned warehouse, where he had kidnapped a woman, apparently Sky, and demanded that she reveal information about government officials in corporations like Oscorp and Stark Industries, believing that they were to blame for his condition. Soon after, they had fought, with Naruto emerging as the clear victor, and the man was imprisoned for arson and kidnapping. I looked you up ever since, saving the mayor and his family from crossbones was your debut, Sky remarked. At first, I wanted to post videos of you taking down thugs and stopping crime, but I realized something. She looked at the hooded hero. You don't have any technical support at all. Patronus admitted sheepishly, I'm not all that good with computers. Is that a yes, number, all right then, Sky said, not looking disappointed. She was actually expecting it. Patronus' attention was drawn to the computer by an open window about a robbery the night before. How about this to persuade you? There was a robbery late last night at the Boston Museum of Art and Antiquities, despite the fact that there were several guards and a top-notch security system, and the thief managed to break in and escape with it. It, as in one? Correct. 
Patronus paused for a moment before asking, Do you have any pictures of the thief? Is the thief going to sell it? Sky chuckled with satisfaction, she had him. Unfortunately, the thief knew where the cameras were, so he or she managed to evade them, but I did hack into several known fences phones and computers to help with the search, Sky said, but she wasn't going to tell the vigilante. He might turn her in for hacking, so she decided to play it safe, dot for the time being. How did you hack into their phones and computers? Patronus inquired, puzzled. Don't you need to be there in person? Sky asked, before laughing. Loudly. Oi, something funny? Sky soon calmed herself down, tears welling up in her eyes. You. Dot you are a caveman. Hey. Fine, fine. It mentioned a meeting at a warehouse near Boston Harbor in one of the fence's phone records, Sky announced proudly, secretly hoping that Patronus would accept her assistance in fighting crime. Naruto, on the other hand, was debating this internally. Should he accept Sky's assistance or reject her in order to fight crime on his own? On the one hand, the hacker can provide him with information faster and more efficiently than he could. On the other hand, she could have a different agenda that could endanger him and his family. I think you're overlooking something, Naruto. Naruto raised an eyebrow under his hood. And what's that, Ashura? Kurama urged his Jinshuriki, you dolts, my power can sense negative emotions, I understand your paranoia, but failing to use the Nine Tails' great power is unacceptable. Why are you in such a foul mood? Naruto inquired, he hasn't done anything to irritate him recently. Ashura laughed as she followed the link, do you really have to ask? He's Kurama, after all. He and Naruto both nodded in agreement, ignoring the fox's curses. While you were talking to Sky here, Kurama and I took the liberty of sensing her emotions the entire time she has no agenda. Besides, you're so bad with technology that it's a miracle you can use a cell phone. After destroying five, Ashura teased casually. That included Mew's first one, right? She was really angry that day, Ashura emphasized as Naruto shook slightly in his seat, which Sky noticed. As the trio took collective gulps, an image of an angry Mew with her blonde hair flaring out like his mother in habanero mode flashed through their minds. Even I was scared of her, and I'm not easily scared, Kurama admitted candidly. Joking aside, having someone familiar with this world on your side would be beneficial. However, if she betrays us, let me take care of her. Deal. Naruto finally said quietly enough for Sky to hear. Really? I thought I had to go through some sort of trial or something akin to being thrown off a cliff. Sky noticed Patronus's body stiffen at the mention of a cliff. You okay? I I'm fine. Now. Where did you say the meeting was? Sky gave him a friendly smile. The Boston Harbor. Naruto grunted as he leapt across a gap on one of the building's rooftops across from the warehouse where the meeting is supposed to be held. He's already seen several men in black patrolling the perimeter, armed with pistols and rifles similar to the ones he saw back at the homestead. Back at home or on a mission in the Soul Universe, Naruto preferred to go with a team or at least someone to back him up, even though Kurama's input indicated that it wasn't necessary. Speaking of which, he was alone because there was no one nearby. Sky is there for him in terms of technical support, but not in terms of combat. Kuroka was simply not ready to leave tonight, which is why he was alone. As much as he wanted her to join him, Naruto saw her skills after the training and knew they weren't good enough. Of course, the Nekomata was irritated and stormed into their room before going out on patrol. So this is where the deal is supposed to go down. Patronus pondered aloud before a cackle erupted in his left ear, irritating him from the static as he created and dispatched his clones to take the men surrounding the perimeter. They briefly shimmered before becoming invisible. Do you dare to doubt me? Sky had given Naruto an earbud that will allow them to communicate, much like the radio he and Konoha 11 used in his world. Sky parked her van five blocks away from the warehouse, so it must have a long range. For her eyes, she used a quadcopter drone that hovered high in the air above the warehouse. Not yet, because you're a hacktivist, what do you know about the stolen artifact? First and foremost, my former crew, as I'm officially your technological assistant, second, the artifact is a book. Equals. Would you mind explaining why this is important? According to the museum logs I hacked earlier tonight, the book was founded by some young British girl, who, after seeing her photo, looks hot. It's strange because I don't hear that very often. Oh, really? Patronus quietly landed on the roof of one of the warehouses after leaping across the gap and expertly traversing the telephone lines. Actually yeah. 
the blonde said into the earbud he got from his informant as his clones took out the men in black on the ground floor stealthily while avoiding being seen by Sky's quadcopter. Patronus received memories of his clones storing the unconscious henchmen in order to avoid alerting the remaining two on the roof, which he will handle himself. Equals anyway. Equals Patronus laughed as the shadows provided him with cover while his ally continued to spout. Equals, this book allegedly contains supernatural voodoo or something, if you ask me, I think you could return it to the museum, in exchange for something. Equals. Like what? The ninja asked before hugging the wall as one of the crooks walked past him, wrapping his arms around his neck and covering his mouth. Ignoring the muffled groans, Patronus moved the body behind one of the air conditioning units before sprinting towards the last one and striking his neck, knocking him out. He reached one of the large paneled windows that allowed him to see the inside of the warehouse after expertly catching the man's rifle and placing it with his fellow man. For a finder's fee. Anyway, from what the British girl wrote on her dossier, it contains knowledge of a secret society that's been at war with an opposing faction for powers in both the mystical and dark arts. Patronus responded with a sigh. Again, why does this have anything to do with me? Because you're a hero, man, albeit not on the same level as the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Daredevil, and... I get it, I get it. Naruto disliked being compared to the more well-known heroes. First and foremost, he is not attempting to make a name for himself. All he wants to do is save people until the time runs out. Now radio silence. I'm about to go to work. His earbud cracked as he entered the open window and landed on the metallic beams. The total number of poor suckers about to meet his fists was probably around 20. The one in the middle appears to be the leader and a wealthy one, as evidenced by his expensive suit and a large diamond ring that briefly shone on his left index finger. Most likely the buyer. Now to await the thief, Naruto pondered as he and the men below waited for several minutes. Naruto. Why are we here? He's a hero, Kurama. Ashura explained, clearly annoyed, for the fifteenth time. His intervention in crime has made Boston and its residents safer. But each time he patrols, the dangers to himself and his family are great. I don't like this world, especially with that shield agency around. Naruto smirked with delight. You're taking your role as Godfather seriously, huh? He couldn't blame the fox because Ashla and Masaki were his first children. Naruto had caught the miniature-tailed beast in the twins' room one night on his way to the bathroom, watching them sleep with his tails curled around their cribs protectively. Silence. He didn't see it, but he could tell Kurama was blushing with embarrassment, and Ashura laughing in his head only confirmed it. Perhaps now is a good time to try one of my new weapons, Naruto thought to himself as he reached for his belt pouch and pulled out his desired weapon. A small dart with a purple feather at the pommel. The assassins used darts throughout history, from the Renaissance to the Age of Empire, including the Golden Age of Piracy, the Seven Years' War, the American Revolution, and so on, until the Order and Templars were wiped out during World War II. The Codex contained recipes for three types of darts, poison, berserk, and sleep. Poison darts were the assassins' bread and butter because they allowed for stealthy assassinations or distractions, but in this case, two types are required. In this case, one in particular was ideal. Here goes, the ninja said, releasing the dart with such force that the air in front of him cut slightly before it struck one of the men in the neck. The targeted man screamed in agony, drawing the attention of his colleagues. What's the matter? The guy next to him asked, rubbing his neck. I don't know. Exact. Hoo-ha. Naruto stood there watching as the drugged man turned berserker attacked his stunned friends with his bat, waving it around wildly. After being struck in the head, the closest guy fell to the ground, and three others rushed towards him in an attempt to stop his befuddled attacks. They, too, were defeated by the berserk man's well-placed strikes to the legs, chest, and heads. Time to work, Patronus muttered as he jumped off the beam and landed on two of the men, knocking them out and drawing the attention of the others. Hello there, boys. Crap. It's the pretender. Patronus dashed forward and knocked the person who said that out with a straight punch before smoothly turning around to avoid a knife strike from another. Patronus smacked his open palms directly into the knife wielder's ears before lifting and tossing him at the incoming men, causing them to collide and fumble into an unconscious heap of thugs. Come on, he's just one man, exclaimed the leader of the thugs as he ordered his men to attack. Patronus smirked beneath his hood as he met their charge and flung his arms in front of the nearest men. His adamantine hidden blades suddenly appeared and lodged in their shoulders before he swiftly kicked their knees to bring them down, 
followed by quick knee strikes to the head. When Naruto heard the cocking of a gun's hammer, he turned around and flicked his left arm just as a rope dart shot out with surprising speed and lodged itself in the gun wielder's shoulder. Ah! Screamed the man as he was dragged by the rope and clothes lined in the neck by Patronus' arm. Patronus quickly dislodged the rope dart from his shoulder and threw it again with the same precision as the shuriken, this time at their legs as it was pulled taunt. He jumped on the tied man and knocked him out with an elbow before throwing a pair of shuriken at the shoulders of two more men. As they screamed in agony while the others remained silent, Naruto decided that enough was enough. Good night, boys, Patronus said before leaping into the air and thrusting his arms forward, palms out. Wind style, gale palm. Dual jet streams of air slammed the remaining men, including the berserker, into the ground. Their heads collided with the hard concrete, and the added pressure from the wind knocked them out. Naruto approached the leader after landing softly and checking his pockets, where he discovered a cell phone. Now let's check the last number, the blonde said, looking over the recent outgoing calls. Where did this come from? And this is where I come in, and what was that about the Gale Palm equals? Just a rant, Sky, Naruto replied gratefully. Boom. Equals, what exactly was that? Equals boom Naruto responded, trouble. Call the Boston Police Department to the warehouse to pick up the thugs, he said, before picking up his robe dart and clipping it to his belt. When Naruto jumped to the roof, he saw the streets on fire with a broken gasoline tanker. But his gaze was drawn to the roof of the building across from the warehouse. What exactly is she doing here? And against whom is she fighting? Who's she, Patronus? Talk to you later. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM, a few minutes before. Who does he think he is, leaving me behind? I'll show him I'm ready. Kuroka raged as he exited the portal. She was really looking forward to patrolling with her husband tonight, but the fact that he had left her with no warning told her about his doubts about his readiness. Kuroka teleported to Boston, specifically his last location, by focusing on his chakra with Senjutsu. Her husband was on the rooftop of a warehouse across the street. Because they were going to patrol Boston with Naruto, Rhea decided they should wear the order's signature uniform, so she made robes for each of them just like she did for Naruto. Kuroka's robes were a modified version of her kimono, similar to the assassin robes. It was the same black color as her regular kimono, but the kimono-like robe had a hood and was tighter fitting rather than loose like her regular kimono. The bottom of her robe concealed her long legs, which were also covered in black knee stockings, while a hole in the back of the robe allowed her tails to pass comfortably. Her hood had cat-shaped mittens to accommodate her cat ears. Finally, her robe, like Naruto's, was fastened around the waist by a purple belt with the assassin insignia in the front. She was upset at first because her cleavage was no longer visible to anyone, especially her husband, but Kuroka realized that the robe made her delightful breasts look even bigger, perhaps even bigger than Rei's. Yemi, Kuroka thought to herself as her two tails swayed lazily in the air beneath her hood. She turned to her left, her senjutsu activated, as an unidentified signature approached in a manner similar to her husband's free running from behind her. Perhaps she can step in before the unknown person reaches the warehouse. That way, she could show Naruto that she was ready to patrol the streets of Boston. With that in mind, the hooded Kuroka turned around and waited for the newcomer to arrive, sensing him approaching and expecting him in 3. Dot 2. Dot 1. Scratch out the him. Who exactly are you? I could ask you the same question, the Nekomata replied, her yellow eyes piercing beneath her hood, which also sadly shadowed her face. Kuroka looked at the newcomer and admitted quietly that she was a little jealous of her costume. The young woman was dressed in a tight black leather costume that accentuated her figure with white fur around her wrists, part of her legs, and, most notably, the neckline, which revealed her cleavage. Her platinum blonde hair reached her shoulders, and her cerulean blue eyes stared back at her, exposing her creamy white skin for Kuroka to see. Her domino eye mask only added to her beauty as her black combat high heels clicked slightly on the roof. The young woman noticed the hooded figure and was disgusted by her impossible assets, when she first saw her, the image of Boston's own superhero flashed through her mind, but it was quickly dispelled when she noticed three things. First and foremost, the hooded figure was taller. Second, the costume was a mix of black and orange, with a sword on his back. Finally, he lacked a tail. Or two tails, for that matter. A knockoff or a sidekick. Don't see many of those these days, the woman mused, a hint of disappointment in her voice. She finally said something. 
I'm Black Cat, and you're in my way. Well, you're going to stop whatever you were going to do and hand over whatever you have in that bag of yours, Kuroka demanded as she and Black Cat circled around each other, their eyes locked on each other as if they were fighting for territory. Black Cat, huh. That could be better, but I'll think of something. What are you going to do about it if I refuse? Black Cat inquired before securing the bag, already anticipating what was to come. She flexed her gloved fingers as Kuroka's tails tensed slightly, indicating that she, too, is preparing. When Black Cat charged towards Kuroka, she smirked inside her hood as she summoned several condensed senjutsu spheres in a circle formation behind her. The Nekomata smiled and waved her hand, and the energy spheres darted towards Black Cat at breakneck speed. To her surprise, Black Cat easily avoided the first sphere before vaulting over the second and sliding under the last few remaining as she got closer to her. Kuroka clenched her teeth and conjured more spheres, which she fired at the approaching enemy, who dodged them with cat-like reflexes and agility. When Black Cat got close enough, she flexed her hands and small silver retractable claws appeared from her fingertips as she swiped them with deadly aim. Kuroka reacted by backstepping to avoid the attacks, but she tripped and fell on her backside. Kuroka hoped as she stood up and saw Black Cat staring at her with widened eyes, hopefully she can ignore that. She looked around with a raised brow and found herself near the edge of the rooftop. Oh, I'm a reincarnated demon as well, but I still have cat-like reflexes. Come here, darling, Black Cat taunted again as she dashed towards the hooded Nekomata and slashed wildly at her. Kuroka dodged a swipe and pounced away from Black Cat to create some space between them, she landed on all fours, her tail swaying side to side and her ears rigid like a cat. Kuroka summoned more senjutsu blasts and fired them at her assailant once more, and she failed. Three explosions ripped through the roof, the vents and air conditioners were destroyed by two and one came into contact with a, boom, oh no. The lone blast struck a gasoline filler tuck. The fiery show illuminated the entire block as nearby buildings were showered with flames. Screams rang out from the building's occupants, who had been caught off guard. Kuroka looked at the ablaze show in front of her in horror at what she'd done. So much so that Black Cat had fled, bag in hand, away from the perimeter. W what have I? She came to a halt as someone in a black hooded haori entered her field of vision, H who? Naruto motioned above him and said, Patronus, Nekohime. Kuroka looked up and noticed a robotic device high in the air with a camera, realizing that they were being watched. She also noticed Naruto's tone was disappointed rather than angry. Thankfully, the hood obscured her face, preventing him from seeing her depressed expression. I am so sorry. We'll talk later. Right now, we need to save people and put out the fire, Naruto said, placing his hand on Kuroka's shoulder. Together. They exchanged a glance before leaping from the rooftop in a swan dive to begin saving people and putting out fires. Following that, the two met up with Sky, who had anonymously called the police to have the men Naruto had fought in the warehouse arrested. Is she okay? Sky inquired of Patronus. Both she and the ninja looked down the alley, where the hooded Nekomata stood, her head slightly hung, away from the van. First night out, Patronus replied curtly, looking solemnly at Kuroka. He looked at Sky and handed her the phone of the thug. Can you figure out where the contacts are in this? Sky plugged the phone into her computer and ran a program to find the most recently called number. According to Naruto's understanding based on Sky's brief lecture, the program will trace the most recent calls in the caller's location, with the hope of locating the buyer behind the theft. Ping ping asterisk, is that a good ping? Naruto inquired as Sky typed several keys, bringing up a screen with a city in focus. A city well known for being the epicenter of heroism and villainy. New York City? He noticed the hacker's displeasure on his face. What's wrong? I didn't get you the caller's exact location or any indication of his identity. Patronus reassured Sky, any information is fine. Thank you, he said as he extended his hand to the hacker, who took it as they shook their limbs. The radio near Sky's laptop then blared the latest news report. Equals, each and every unit. A robbery is taking place in Chinatown. Hostels are thought to be armed and dangerous. Equals. Are you ready for an entire night of crime fighting? Born to be ready. Naruto and Sky both looked at Nekohime, who was making circles with her gloved finger. She noticed the stairs and realized they were waiting for her. Naruto was providing her with a second chance, and she took it as Kuroka nodded and walked over to them. Sky gave Nekohime an earbud as well, despite her jealousy of the woman's large assets. 
Naruto looked between them after assisting Kuroka with the earbud and said, let's go. Boston and its citizens had gained two new members to help their local hero fight crime. Rhea, Medusa, and Seiko are joined by Naruto, Kuroka, and Sky for a total of five. Morning, the following day, Manhattan, 200 John Street. City of New York, New York a lone person stood with an aura of understanding and amusement, staring out the panoramic window at the city's famous skyline as the sun began to rise over the horizon. He arrived in New York not long ago to warn the city's heroes of an impending danger that will soon arrive to hunt them down. Actually, to find him, the one considered by some residents to be the city's heart. But, for the time being, he will continue to make preparations and contingencies with his wealth and that of the organization that his company, Webcore, is funding and sheltering as a base of operations. Mr. Sims? The man turned around to see his secretary standing near the door, holding files. Here are the latest reports on the target, plus a new file on another. The woman placed the files on top of his desk, and he nodded for her to leave for the day. Have a good night. Thank you, Martha, Sims said before returning his gaze to the window and catching his reflection in it. He was old, but he appeared to be able to do things like a young man in his prime. His hair was short and silver, and his sideburns were scruffy and slightly longer. His brown suit was slightly worn and wrinkled from the day's exhausting work, but his feet had made no complaints. Sims found great comfort in being barefoot in his office and personal time throughout the city since he acquired them that day and began amassing his wealth with his gifts. Sims walked to his deck and sat in his luxurious chair after much deliberation before picking up the reports on his main target. However, he decided to read them later because the new file, which was about a vigilante defending Boston from crime, piqued his interest. Patronus is the name given to the hooded figure. One of his contacts in S.H.I.E.L.D. that he and his company had meticulously and carefully planted had informed him of the scuffle between the new vigilante and Captain America. Normally, he wouldn't keep track of heroes or villains unless they piqued his interest in addition to his main target. Captain America, the Hulk, Iron Man, the X-Men, the Inhumans, and now Patronus are heroes in this category. However, the pictures that the hunter and the organization assigned to Boston to keep tabs on Patronus did not help him at all. He could only rely on Captain America's description of the new vigilante because they were all blurry on the person. Sims began reading, a black hooded robe with a katana on his back and a small blade from under his right wrist. He appeared to be skilled in martial arts. Patronus also appeared to be somewhat secretive about his existence, as he refused to listen to my words. His physical strength and martial arts ability allowed him to match my attacks blow for blow. I was quite amazed and surprised at the time because I assumed he was just a normal person defending his city. Patronus, huh? Sims thought to himself. And, for starters, it's not about animals. This Patronus character could be useful in his plans for dealing with the impending major threat. As stated in the report, he is a complete unknown, and according to his shield informant in an encrypted message, the agency, along with sister agencies like SWORD, is attempting to gather more information on the new hero. All that remains is to find him and bring him to Manhattan for a meeting. Uzumaki Manor and the Homestead Grounds, Massachusetts is forested. After returning from their night of patrolling, Naruto and Kuroka remained silent. They dealt with the attempted robbery and other crimes alongside Hacker and Ally Sky. Naruto had returned the earbuds to Sky after wiping them clean of his and Kuroka's DNA to prevent them from being traced back to them, and had set up a rendezvous point for them to meet so they could head towards New York City. Before they left, Kuroka told Naruto and Sky about Black Cat, who still had the artifact and with whom the hacker was familiar, as the latter's base of operations was also in New York City. It's like killing two birds with one stone. When Naruto and Kuroka returned home, they decided to postpone the dreadful discussion until they were better rested. They were sitting in their pajamas next to each other until Naruto finally spoke. Ku, I apologize. That fire, it was a mistake. Kuroka apologized hesitantly. I just, I wanted to demonstrate that I was capable of doing what you do. I wanted to stop that black cat, but I made things worse. I had no idea she was a thief until you told me last night. I guess I'm not cut out for being a superhero. Kuroka. Naruto snatched her hand in his. I must admit that I was disappointed and appalled when you endangered the people in those buildings. Kuroka's ears hung down as her husband chastised her. But, I suppose I was also to blame. Her ears perked up as she noticed Naruto sighing. I should not have left you here and taken you with me. Kuroka, I'm not perfect at this. I'm still learning as I go, 
but I do my best with what I have, and that's what I'd like to have with you. The Nekomata twitched her ears and tilted her head, what exactly do you mean? I should have trusted your abilities and skills back then. Is that why you didn't send me back home after what happened? Kuroka was taken aback by the idea and asked with wide eyes, you wanted me to learn from experience. And your blunders? First and foremost, always be aware of your surroundings. Naruto elaborated, whenever you're up against a thug or black cat, as you call her. She gave herself that nickname. Kuroka's cheeks puffed out, making her look cute, and Naruto chuckled. Well, I think Nekohime is better than Black Cat. I like it, too. Kuroka approached Naruto and licked his hand. However, I believe I should take a break from heroism. Everyone makes mistakes, Kuroka. It is simply a matter of learning to deal with them. And keep in mind that we'll always be there for each other. Naruto leaned in and licked Kuroka's cheek slowly. The Nekomata purred sensually as she licked her lips. I'll be there for you always, girls. You had better. Kuroka purred once more as she undid the front of her black gown, revealing her ample breasts. Cuz you still need to get me pregnant with strong babies. Oh, I know. Naruto agreed to accompany Sky to New York City because it was better. The rendezvous time was set for 10 o'clock in the morning. Naruto looked at the grandfather clock in the reading room, which read 8.45, play time of 1 hour and 15 minutes. Hubby, Kuroka exclaimed, spreading her legs wide for him to see her glory while playing with her right boob. Oh, yes. There is plenty of time. The ninja attacked her playfully as she cried out joyfully, entering another round of unbelievable pleasure before returning to his heroic duty that would take him to a city in the south. A city at the cutting edge of technological advancement and cultural significance. A city that will put his skills and beliefs that he has held since childhood to the test. A city that will pit him against both good and evil to be continued that's it for this podcast thank you for listening to this video i hope you did enjoy this video the story and if you did like share and subscribe for more and thank you all for having support and have a great day